Okay, we are officially live with our uh, with yet another uh, in the Impex uh, Deep Distillery Deep Dive series, or, or, or better known as the uh, the Impex 3D series. Uh, the first few episodes that we had uh, featured uh, whiskey. And now we're, we're going to take a bit of a detour from whiskey. Sometimes it's nice to take a, a little bit of a detour from whiskey. Some may not agree, but I don't agree with those who don't agree with me. Uh, we're going to take a detour uh, into the wide and wild world of rum with the good Mitch Wilson. He's the global brand ambassador uh, for Black Tot Rum. And he's, he's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, calling in from somewhere in the uk i want to say i want to say london proper but but he'll he'll correct me if i'm wrong let me bring this gentleman on there he is mr wilson how are you i'm doing well how are you sir wonderful it's so good to be here it's so uh it's lovely to be on video with you i think we've done audio before but never video this is a new new experience that's very true. Yeah, that, yeah. For uh, for those that are watching, if if you're not familiar, I've run a podcast called One Nation Under Whiskey, and we made a we made a special dispensation. We created an, an episode called uh, One Nation Under Rum, and that was and that was with you. That was a great time. It, it was. I, I've um, I contacted recently a, a whiskey club here in the UK. Uh, and they responded saying they were the third J of the single cask nation trio. And, uh, and yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I, I now feel like I've contacted all of the J's in the single cask nation. So. Exactly. You know, put a J in your first name and, and you could be just as lucky. It could happen. It could happen. <laughs> So thank you so much for, for joining us. I, you know, I realize it's, it's one thirty in the morning, your time and you're drinking some sort of very strong coffee drink. I'm, I'm sort of alternating between the rum and the coffee and it's just, right. I'm, I'm just starting my day early, you know, just, just getting a head start on everyone else. <laughs> um, so let's, for, I, I imagine there, there are a few people on here. Um, that that are surely familiar with whiskey, but not necessarily familiar with rum. Obviously, we're going to be focusing on black top, but in a way, at least when it comes to black top finest care, actually any of the black top products, you can't just focus on black top because there are a lot of things inside black top that make it what it is, right? Um, but I wonder if you could, uh, if you could just go into a bit um, some of the history around black tot, maybe maybe the original black tot, and then and then we'll we'll get to this. We'll get to this, and I know, I know we have some other black tot releases we'll want to talk about as well. But from an outsider's perspective, what is what is black tot? What is black tot? Is a very good question. It's a uh, I, I suppose that sort of blends into a bigger question as to what is navy rum in general. So, black tot, the name, if uh, if if you're just just being introduced to this, uh, refers to uh, hey Brian, uh, refers to uh, Black Tot Day, which was the day, the 31st of July, 1970, when the navy finally culled off the navy rum ration uh, for the British Royal Navy. So for 239 years. They used to give a daily top of rum, uh, neat if you were a higher grade officer, diluted down if you were in the lower ranks, and it was part of it was part of the morale. It was part of the the daily sort of service. It was actually part of the pay of these sailors on the ships as well. Um, and there was there there was many different reasons why this booze became such a, a daily tradition on the ships. You know, for for one reason, water was. Uh, unsafe it was not clean it was uh you know if if you drank water you were worse off than drinking beer or whiskey or anything else um by having booze on ships it was a way of 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 something that was uh, <laughs> 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 part of the experience 
I, I did up an extra button, actually. I thought I'll, I'll behave for the US. I don't want to give too much excitement early on. Um, yeah, we're, we're, a prudish, <laughs> we're a prudish people, so I appreciate that. Well, it's been, you know, anything could happen in the next 24 hours. Um, <laughs> we're literally on the edge of the world staring into the abyss, so I don't want to, I don't want to push us over too far. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so we have this, we, we have this unusual situation, you know, and we're talking about 400 years ago, you know, early, mm -hmm. uh, or late, late 1500s, early 1600s. You've got um, navies from various European powers at the time, uh, you know, trying to trying to plant flags and make their mark around the world and colonize anywhere they could. Um, and and part of stocking up the provisions for these ships was having having resources, having food, drink, anything that would last the voyage. Um, so coming coming from Britain, coming from England, we were we were a beer drinking country. So we would generally take beer on our voyages. Um, mm. If if you were a higher grade officer, again, if you had a bit more money, you could maybe afford gin or brandy. Um, you know we we did like these things. We loved brandy, we loved cognac. We hated the French, so we'd try not to give them money whenever we could. Um, <laughs> but generally anything you could put on a barrel, anything you could travel with, you would, you would carry with you on these ships. And, and by the time we start, you know, colonizing the Caribbean and the, the Spanish and the Portuguese sort of had a head start and the British came in, the French came in. Um, and then around the early 1600s, when you start seeing the first rum production happening and rum becomes this easy solution of the spirit that you would take on the way back home you know so you've drunk, you've drunk all the beer you've drunk anything else you had on the ship what do you top up with and the the earliest reference we have to this in in writing is 1655 so uh the british fight the spanish for jamaica and they failed to take hispaniola sort of cuba that kind of area mm -hmm. um, we went for Jamaica instead. We managed to get Jamaica. And then after the Battle of Jamaica, which lasts about a month, everyone is given a tot of rum. And this is the first sort of reference of rum being the Caribbean spirit or something given to sailors. Mm. And then about 80 years later, this becomes codified in the Navy rules. It says you can either have eight pints of beer every day. Uh, eight pints of beer by any man's standards is as good they are, right? Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's your daily ration. So eight pints of beer or half a pint of overproof spirits per day. And that can be that can be rum, that can be brandy, that can be gin, that can be any any spirit. But generally once we start going to the Caribbean and and, and this kind of area, the rum becomes the the spirit of choice. It becomes what's available. It becomes the the sort of mark of the, the naval forces that have gone to this area. And, and just just for those that are watching uh, from the US, when you're talking pint, you're talking an imperial pint, which is yeah. 20 ounces rather than, so a US pint is 16 ounces, you, you get four more ounces. So if they get a half pint uh, of, of overproof rum as a daily ration, that, that's 10 ounces. Yeah, That's 10 big pours of rum per day. How do people work? <laughs> well, not very well is what we found, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you start, and, and before this date, it's, it's kind of important to realize it was kind of your ship, your ship, your rules, you know? So you, mm. you measured out, you were like, well, we'll give this much, we'll give this much. There'll be some ships who are more, uh, <laughs> more <laughs> just having trouble, trouble with triples. <laughs> Go on. <Yeah. laughs> I think the hair's looking great, Josh. I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm work. I'm working on mine. It's starting to starting to fray out. So getting there. It's getting there. I hope at the end of our lockdown, we're going to have you know something comparable. Um, <laughs> so, um, what was the question? Sorry, I completely lost my track there with the. With the well, we, we were we were talking about how that's basically you know twenty ounces of rum per person. Yeah. That's, that's a or ten ounces of rum per person. And how does one get work done? Exactly. So so at the start, it's a very 
you know, your ship, your rules, everyone does their own thing. And then from 1731 is when we codify it and we put the half pint of overproof spirits or eight pints of beer. And they very, very quickly realized this is insanity. You know, everyone's getting drunk, everyone's going wild, everyone's like throwing each other over and having fights. Um, <laughs> Adrian, um, this is this the second time that line's been used. I had a pina colada of destiny earlier on tonight. Now it's the copy of destiny. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> so everyone's having these, everyone ha having these fights. It's completely un unruly, and they they gradually decide let's let's halve that ration. Let's halve it from mm. half a pint to a quarter of a pint, <laughs> half a pint from quarter to an eighth, and eventually in 1740 we see. Admiral Edward Vernon, who says, right, we're going to water this rum ration down. All of the lower officers will get theirs watered down with, you know, I think it's two parts rum to one part water early on in the stage. Mm -hmm. um, still, still got some booze to it, but, you know, it's, it's tempered. It's, it's the ABV is lower down. Um, yeah. And, and the sailors kind of hate it, but they kind of, you know, there's, there's all this sailor lingo and jack speak that we call it, uh, where they have their own words and terms for everyone. Because Edward Vernon used to wear this grog coat, this waterproof coat, and they called him Old Grog. And when he watered down the rum, they called the rum Grog. So oh, okay. um, the Grog tub where they watered it down, it all became known as Grog, all as a sort of, sort of a play on words and a little dig towards edward vernon and uh yeah that's where we get navy grog from so oh that's interesting you know it from how should i say this you, you know whenever i heard the stories of grog it was the the story was a bit different in that you know they had to carry around potable water drinking water that could easily get parasites in it so what do you do to keep the parasites away you, you add rum to that water so you're still getting hydrated but you're also getting a bit of your rum was it so was that uh were both stories the case what's well, it's i again i think to a certain extent it might depend on what what ship you were in okay. and, and, and also which, which country you were coming from as well you know so like if we remember the the british navy we did we gave up the rum ration in 1970 um different navies around the world called their rum rations at different times. So in America, I believe it was 1862, you guys called off the rum ration. So almost, well, 108 years before the British Navy stopped it, rum rum was 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 no longer given out in the American Navy. Mm -hmm. Different places gave it at different times. New Zealand was the last to give it up. So uh, 28 February, 1990. Uh, they gave up their rum ration, so 20 years after the British Navy. Um, so, so different place at different time gave it up. It was a different, you know, uh, the idea of whether it was purifying the water, that's a much better spell, right? That's a much easier thing to say, oh, we were just trying to make the water cleaner. In actual fact, we've got records that say when British ships left harbour from, from England, they'd leave with beer, loads of beer barrels, loads of fresh water barrels. Even though the water would go off first, they would still drink the beer first because they would mm -hmm. rather have off water or take their chances on getting the water stocked up again than they would drinking sour, horrible beer. And depending on the length of the voyage would determine the, the ABV of the beer that you took on. So if it was a short voyage, you would take a low ABV beer, say three, four percent, maybe. Mm. Um, if it was a longer voyage, you know, especially like th these ideas of like the India pale ales and going on these longer treks, you would take mm. a high ABV beer because that that extra alcohol would keep the beer fresher for longer um, before it went sour, before it went off. So, uh, okay, okay, that's very interesting. Okay, so. So that that's the story of, of black tie. Like you'd said, the uh, you know, in nineteen seventy for, for the UK uh, uh, naval officers, that that black tie day was in nineteen seventy, fifty years ago. And different countries 
cut off their their alcohol rations uh, in different periods. And someone had mentioned, there we go, many militaries still have alcohol rations, including Italy and India. I did not know that. Um, I mean, so I, I, I imagine I imagine the Italians would have to have a parity of OL no matter what they were doing. So, you know. It's just big <laughs> vats of Campari, I think. <laughs> it's a massive Aperol <laughs> spritz. <laughs> <laughs> but even even in the British Navy today, I mean, they they still have the the sort of loophole, like of splicing the main brace, so the Queen or the Admiral of the Navy can uh, issue a tot of rum still, and so a lot of these ships will still carry rum aboard in case that order is given for a special occasion or oh, wow. for a feat. So. So it doesn't mean that there there isn't rum on these ships or isn't spirits on these ships or, you know, even the, even the modern navy, as far as I know, is still entitled to a couple of beers every day and things like that. You know, you're mm. quite often you're on these voyages for anywhere from three months to two years. So there is still a, a morale aspect to to keeping your crew on board, giving them their days off, giving them something to look forward to, but. The, the difference here is we're not now doing this daily ration of rum where it's like, okay, here's a here's a fairly hefty tot of rum still that you've got to down straight away. And we're on a, a nuclear submarine or an aircraft carrier. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it doesn't have that same connotation. It's a it's a it's a special treat rather than a, a daily expectation. Got it. Got it. I want to show a, a picture here really quickly because I think I think we're getting to the part of the conversation. Let me just make sure I'm doing this right. Share screen, not that one. This one. Share. There we go. Ah, so, nice. right. So this is this was really the inspiration for for this bottle right the the finest caribbean and what you're talking about all of this history of the ships going from port to port to port from country to country um you know co collecting rum along the way can you and 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 obviously and just so you know those who are watching are aware that that bottling that i just showed is it's called black top last consignment um it's been on the market for a little bit um there's more coming into the market into the u.s market and i'm sure it's in a few other countries too but can you go over that part of the history of of, of this particular rum absolutely yeah so so the this this is for me where the the navy rum ration gets really interesting so it wasn't just uh just a part of the the daily provisions but from a from a rum point of view it, it really marked the start of one of the world's most interesting rum blends so when when we first started going to the caribbean and first started you know these essentially everything was off the back of the sugar industry you no know, sugar refineries was were started up um this was the beginning of uh you know because yeah, colonialism, the sugar trade, the slave triangle, everything that went on in the Caribbean started off the back of the sugar industry. And as a result of making all this sugar, you had byproducts like molasses. And molasses were, you know, if you've ever had molasses, black, tarry, sticky, still full of some nutrients, still got a sugar content, very fermentable, mm -hmm. very easily uh fermented and distilled and turned into turned into booze but these molasses which which came off the back of the sugar industry were for the most part uh, a waste product you know something which didn't have that much inherent value to them um by bringing distillations to the caribbean by by turning them into rum suddenly we have all of these different islands all of these different countries making this incredibly full-on, flavorful, intense booze that didn't have the same connotations that any other alcohol around the world had. You know, if we hmm. if we look at whiskey, if we look at vodka, if we look at a any other kind of booze we make, typically what we're looking at is we've got a food source, we've got 
crops which we're planting, growing over several months, harvesting, pulling together, and then, then we have a choice. We go, do we turn this into food or do we turn it into booze? Mm, and yep. which, is, which is why you and I are not in charge of the nation's food resources because we'd all be going hungry, but we'd have a great time. <laughs> Distill everything. Just, just, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. There's a lot going on coming. Come on, let's do it. Um, so, so throughout all of these different countries' histories, you have these bans on distillation because there's a famine going on, or there's a food shortage, and it's and it's necessary to to dedicate these crops or these food sources to actual food, like stop making whiskey. We need to make some bread or whatever it is. You know, like we need to actually eat. Um, rum has never had this issue. You know, rum was was literally a, a luxury product which was, mm. was uh, built off the back of, of slavery and built off the back of all these other, you know, quite horrible colonial things that then had this waste product. And the waste product itself was, well, we can repurpose this quite easily in spirit and almost have a, almost have a limitless supply of it. So, okay. so then you have this, this situation where all of these different European powers are coming into the to the Caribbean and South America and Central America. Rum is being made in several different places. There's many different styles, many, many different approaches, which we can get onto soon. But what what became this sort of necessity very early on was if you have uh, an entire naval fleet that needs rum and needs a supply, and we've now codified it so they have to have a certain amount on board and a certain amount supplied. Yeah. It starts to become unproductive to make them grab different casks from different islands and different places. And instead, logistically, you bring it all to a central point. So, so for us in the English Navy, it was a case of let's bring it all to London, let's consolidate it there, blend it there, cask it there, and then put it back onto ships. So different merchants, different traders would bring all this rum back to London. It would be sold off either privately for private bottlings and private blends mm -hmm. and what have you. Um, and then the Navy itself would put out tenders and say, right, we need 100,000 gallons of Jamaican rum. We need uh, 50,000 gallons of Barbados rum. We need this, we need that. Mm -hmm. the merchants would put in their tenders. They'd buy the rum. They'd blend it all together, cask it, bring it down to a set ABV because that was a way of standardizing it and making sure every ship had the same amount per cask. You know, you didn't have different, different, you know, one cask going out at 70% ABV, one cask going out at 50%, like everything was standardized to the same ABV, yeah. put into a cask, put onto the ship and sent back out. Um, and, and yeah, you know, from, from a blending point of view, we see this completely unique approach to blending spirits. And, and not necessarily because of choice, not because some master blender was saying, you know, it would be wonderful for the Navy if we took that fruity Bayesian style rum and mixed it with some mm. high Jamaican rum and some rich chocolate Guyanese rum and put them all together. That would be delicious. It was just a case of let's get it all together. Let's bring it all in one place and blend it together. And, and the different flavors created by different countries meant you got this sort of world blend of rum coming together. Um, and, and it's unique in spirits. We don't see it with whiskey. We don't see, you know, Scotch, Irish, but yeah, yeah. together, put together, like, unless it's a gimmick or unless it's one off or something. It's yeah. generally not done by style. Um, you don't see it with any other spirit. Rum, rum came about this way because of the logistics of it. And, and through it, we see this blending of flavors, this layering of flavors, which would not happen in any other, any other category. So it's um, it's it's something completely unique, and and so this blending process, how how? Because my understanding is that the the blending was done in in sort of large tons, right? Large, you know, massive holding tanks, and so over how 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 long the period of time did this this blending go on? Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at the, um, I'm actually waiting for some of the archives to open back up because we're trying to get some exact dates on this. Um, um, 
Matt Petrek, who's the writer behind Cocktail Wonk, um, mm. based over in New Orleans there. He's been doing a lot of research into the Navy Rum category, and we've had a lot of conversations back and forth about this. Um, it appears the earliest records of these blending vats being built is sort of around the uh, first 10 years of the 1800s, so around 1805, 1806, something like that. They mm -hmm. build these giant blending vats in London. Um, and, and the ones in Deptford kind of started all off. So there are three giant blending vats connected together with a, a metal pipe, like a third of the way up the vat. They were mm -hmm. all open top, so the casks of, of rum could be dumped in the top of these vats, blended together. Um, and, and from that, that was the, the sort of first iteration of the Navy rum blend. Um, wow. okay. that, that blend continued, as, as far as we can see, that blend continued pretty much almost up until Black Tot Day itself. So from early 1800s to about 1950, 1960, we believe, that that's carried on. Um, so for about 100, 150 years, you're just continuously topping up this rum blend stirring it together, churning it together, um, huh. and it down to proof and issuing it out. Now, um, that that was sort of the main hub of the rum blend. Now, we also know there were different uh, blends and different blending houses set up because you didn't That's want perfect. it all to come. You didn't want it all to come from, from one place because what if your fleet was in another part of England or another part of the world? So we, we know there were blending houses in... Uh, you know, in Portsmouth, in Scotland, in Singapore, mm. uh, later on in Australia as well. So it really, you know, depending on where your fleet was or depending on where your ships were, they could top up at any of these, any of these different places. You know. um, and and at, and so you know, Brian had asked a question here. Was the recipe generally the same from place to place, or did or did it? or did it change? Uh, would you have a slightly different blends from location to location? It's a, it's a brilliant question. Um, so as far as we know, it, essentially they would all follow the same, same kind of blend and same kind of recipe depending on what was available. Um, we, we have certain records of various blends being put together. Um, I can actually play you a video showing one of the, the vitrilling yards, one of these blending warehouses uh, in Rangerton in England, and they can, you know, they actually say what their blend percentages are for the rum ration that they issue there. Um, my my understanding is, as much as possible, there would have been a consistency amongst it. But what mm -hmm. we found is with some of the flagons that made up last consignment that, that you showed before, there are there are different versions of the Navy rum ration that evolve over time. And again, part of that would be availability. You know, if there's less of a particular rum available that year or, or the economy in one country isn't able to produce a certain amount, then well, we'll make up the shortfall somewhere else. So. There's, there's generally a perception of Navy rum, especially British Navy rum, that it would just come from British colonies, you know, uh, Guyana, Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, you know, and that would be all that was in it. But mm -hmm. we, we also have records of rum coming from Martinique, from Cuba, from Africa, uh, you know, from Australia later on as well. So it wasn't the... Uh, the, the blend, the recipe, the idea we've been sold about Navy rum over the years isn't necessarily how it actually was. It was really just get whatever you can, put it in. And yeah. we, we have a, a, an instance where Jamaica rum is actually stopped um, from, from being added to the Navy rum blend because they say it was too funky, too intense. Oh, but, wow. then, but then in World War II, there's a shortage of rum so they add Jamaica rum back in because it's available. So it's okay. like, it's like well, well, yes, there are instances where, where things are done by choice, but there's also a, a logistical necessity and what, what was available was, was added to these rums. So 
But um, I, I'd love to show you, if it's okay, I'll show you this little video. Yeah, please, um, please. Because this gives you a little idea of how, of how these were put together and how these were put in. Uh, so. yep. yeah, as soon as you share it, I will approve the share. Um. Yeah. All right, so this is, from, this is from uh, a victualling yard in, uh, in England in a place called Rangerton. Uh, and this is where they, they would supply ships with meat, clothing, supplies, dry goods, um, everything that they needed to avoid, including the rum. And here we'll see a little bit about the, the rum blending they do there as well. I did say 74,000 gallons of rum earlier on, but that's not all. At the William Yard, they even make their own rum cut. This highly skilled work is still done by hand. With loving care, the coopers repair and remake empty cups returned by the neighbors. When they're finished and polished, one goes a brass plate with a traditional The Queen, God Bless Her, engraved on it. As for the hooch itself, it's blended at Rangerton. Navy issue rum, or Nelson's blood, is blended to a recipe almost as old as the Navy itself. Mr. Charlton explained it all to me. When we went about 40, 40 years of proofs, uh, our job was to put it in the vat and bring it down to 4.5 under proof, the strength ratio to the fleet. How does that compare with the uh, rum I would buy in a shop? Well, the rum you buy in a shop, we've got 33 and a third under proof. Well, when we get the rum, we have at the moment four varieties, Demerara, Trinidad, Barbados, and Australian. The Navy had their own particular blends, which is 60% Demerara, 30% Trinidad, and 10% uh, the Barbados, or 5% of Barbados, or Australian. We put uh, quantity into the bat. Uh, we know by experience now it's about 1,200 gallons to make our mix of 1,900 gallons when we add the water. We put it into the end of the bat, and then we turn on the agitator, you can see it behind me, give it a good turnover for uh, three or four hours. Then we take the strength of the mixture at the top of the vat and the bottom of the vat. When there is the strength degree, we know then the strength of our own mixture. We then add the appropriate amount of water required, which we get from a formula that we want so many gallons of water to bring that run down to the strength of 4.5 degrees under. We put the in, put the agitator on again, give it another good turn up for three or four hours. Then we once again, we take a series of two for strength tests from top of the mixture and bottom of the mixture. And when we find that they're both 4.5, or we can't always get 4.5 exactly, but 4.3, 4.6, then we know the mixture is ready for issue to the fleet. And then you cask it. And then we cask it, as you can see, on the, the cask under the taps, the one we either put in the cured against for big ships, which is 18 gallon cask, smaller ships, 10 gallon cask, or for submarines or on a small boat, we put it into one gun and jars. And finally, the controlling nerve. So, so yeah, that's just wow. a little insight, I guess, into to what they were doing there. And there's, there's a couple of interesting things there. You know, you see Australian rum being part of the blend at this stage. And this video would have been taken in the 60s. So that would have been a later addition into the Navy rum blend, probably not from mm -hmm. the start. Uh, well, it couldn't have been from the very start because they wouldn't have had the rum there. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, little things like you see him using a, you know, a, a hydrometer to measure the ABB. So there's no, no gunpowder test, no setting things on fire to test. It's like, no, they have the technology to do all this as well. So. And they were using some interesting terminology that I wasn't familiar with, right? 4.5 degrees below proof. Mm -hmm. So what is, could you explain that a little bit to us? Yes, so this is this is slightly tricky if you're following it at home, but I'll I'll try and try and explain it as clear as I can. So, do, do I need a calculator? You might need Everybody, a calculator. You might need, okay, all right. Okay, calculate this out. This will, be, this will be helpful. So, um, so when we when we look at is sometimes you'll see this on old uh, old rum bottles where instead of an ABV or the, the, the proof in America, say, you'll actually have like something like 70 and then a degrees sign. A right. Yeah. Okay. So 70 degrees will be what that is saying. That little degree sign is saying this is 70% of proof or 
what we'd say 30 under proof. Now proof in UK terms is different to US terms. So this gets even more confusing. So if we say 100 proof in US, what we're saying is 50% ABV. If we're saying proof in the UK, we're saying 57.15% ABV because we hate round numbers and we just want to make it as confusing as possible. You know, so so 57.15% is proof. If I say it's four and a half degrees under proof, what I'm saying is times 57.15 times it by 0.955. So almost like half percent of 57.15 will give me four and a half degrees under proof, which is 54.5% ABV. When he says, when he says a normal run will be 30 degrees under proof, he's saying it's 70% of proof. So 57.15 times 0.70 would give you about 40% ABV. So like a standard shop bottling of a normal okay. Okay. Um, So yeah, it's a really, you know, before decimals, right? <laughs> before we decimalized everything, made it, made it easier, much, much harder um, to understand. So everything he's talking is a percentage of something else and added to and taken away and all this kind of stuff. So, so yeah, but Navy, Navy strength was 54.5% ABV. And as he says, sometimes it was like 0.1 or two up or down because mm -hmm. they're working, they're working with vast amounts of liquid. It might have been slightly off, but five uh, was the, the standard. That's Navy strength. You know, and it, it, it gets confusing because you hear proof, you hear overproof, you hear Navy strength. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of companies over the years have used sort of different numbers and just called it whatever they wanted to call it because because it is so confusing, you can almost say whatever you want and just get away with it if you market, well, market it well enough. You know, so. A question that's always sort of rattled around in my head when it comes to to rum in general and the term Navy rum. You know, my, my understanding of the origins of that term was it was a rum that was provided to people by the Navy. Uh, but if that's no longer done, yet people are still provide, you know, bottling and selling Navy rums, how is it, how is it connected? Is it ABV? Is it where the rums are being sourced from? Is it a combination of the two? Um, I I think in in its most initial guise, Navy Rum was was a wonderful marketing term. You know, it mm -hmm. was if it's good enough for the Navy, it's good enough for us. You know, it's that. Okay. So so even when the Navy was still getting their rum ration, you had uh, you know you had Coroni Navy Rum. You had yeah. various various brands and labels and different bottlers calling their rum. Navy rum because it was it was considered a, a prestigious thing you know it's like this is what this is what the boys are drinking at sea so this is what we can drink and this is proper rum you know it was a it was a mark of honor it was, it was a badge of quality um over the years that that perception has changed largely so um you know so for the british royal navy we we called the rum ration in 1970 um Nine years later, you had uh, a very well-known rum brand startup called Pusses. Um, so mm -hmm. Pusses, Pusses went, well, here is this sort of this idea, this, this beautiful heritage we have of, of Navy rum being this, this great tradition. Let's bring it back and, and bottle it and, and we'll call it. And, okay. and, it was, and it was genius. You know, you have a lot of the Navy rum that exists today comes off the back of of brands like that going well this was the idea let's 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 recreate it and let's sure let's build this idea and um, over the last few years i'd say the last it was certainly the, the years that i was a bartender and, and the years that most people nowadays would be looking at navy rum generally navy rum has become this sort of cheaper you know lighter younger mm -hmm. very colored often quite sweet like not it's it's a diminished form of what it used to actually be you know sure. um, yeah and 
and Navy Rum is often often not associated as a quality product, but as a very you know, cheap, nasty, what's well, something you're going to mix or put into a cocktail anyway. And when you try something like Last Consignment, as, as you threw up on the screen before, mm -hmm. it's not that at all. You know, it's super complex, it's super flavorful, it's one of the most challenging, interesting, fascinating rum blends you'll ever try. You know, it's... Uh, Got yeah. just a little bit left. Oh, it's just <laughs> when, when when you first try it, it can almost just it, it can almost be over overpowering. You know, you, you try it. And there's so much going on because it's because it's not just one flavor profile. It's not just one island or country style. It's this this mix of everywhere that was continuously topped up. You know, it's yeah. it's it's so unique. It's it's almost hard to put your finger on it. So it's um. Uh, you know, and it's, it's it's funny. I think one one of the I always joke about this, but one one of the guys in America was like, "Oh, surely it would never be, it would never be that good. Surely they wouldn't give the Navy the best stuff because it was just a a standard daily ration." It was like, "Well, yeah, but for them back then, the standard daily ration was rums like Port Morant, rums like Caroni, rums, you know, pot still rums, multi-column." industrial stills that we have today mm -hmm. didn't exist you know what what they yeah. have is the stuff that now if you put it in a bottle rum nerds would go nuts for they pay you know hundreds and thousands of dollars for these rums because they don't exist anymore but that mm -hmm. was the stuff that was there that was just what was available back then so it's um it, it really is you know when you try something like last consignment it's a moment in time it's it's trying a lot of these distilleries and 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 incredible places that just don't exist anymore. So, yeah. and hey, Josh, Josh was at that's very So, Josh is here in the UK, he's in London uh, with us. Okay, so we, we've, we've been for anyone who's watching, we, we are just as of now heading into lockdown in the UK for a month. So, we just had our last night at Trailer Happiness tonight. So, Josh was there, a few others were there. We were like seeing out seeing out london for the last month so i don't think anyone's ever tried to do a rum tasting after a night of trailer happiness but we're doing it here now so we're making history <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic no no one knew if it could be done we still don't but... <laughs> so i'm i'm about to pour a little bit more of the finest caribbean ah yeah right. so i i, I started off with that and uh, the unfortunate thing ab about this rum is it's too easy to drink and so I find I find my my glass just I keep finding the bottom of my glass and that's it's not such a good thing yeah. um, one of the things that that drew me to black top rum or the, or the idea of black top rum and this was this was I think before it was even a product and and Ali Chilton was was explaining the product to me. So the idea behind it was was to be a incredibly transparent, which I love, and and I, and I want to get into this because you know the interesting thing is with this series thus far, everyone I spoke with is is from a, a from a distillery, right? You're not from a distillery. However, you're sourcing from distilleries, and I think there's a bit that you can share about the distilleries that are sourced from for this yeah. rum. So, so I really loved the idea uh, that this would be a highly transparent rum, especially nowadays when there isn't so much transparency. Maybe that's changing, and, and I'd love to, to to hear more about that if it is. Um, and then, and then the other thing was. Ali seemed to want to ride this very fine line of a rum that whiskey drinkers could easily gravitate to, but also a rum that's good enough for rum geeks as well. And those two worlds don't always collide, but I I feel as if they they it's it was like a head-on collision here. Yeah. So yeah, you want to take us through uh, this this particular blend? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, I guess first of all, I'd love to uh, I'll throw up on the screen 
Mm. Uh, that's just a little information for everyone. So if you haven't seen this breakdown before, um, this is uh, this is what's going on in this run. This is this is what it's all about. So, um, uh, are you able to throw that up on the screen, Josh? Is that coming up? It's not coming up on my end. No. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Now try it. Oh, jeez. Uh, Mitch looks a little frozen. Let's see if he unfreezes anytime soon uh oh i think this is what happens when one goes out to the trail of happiness for a night oh here we go he's coming back in oh, all right <laughs> you, you know th this this is the result of going to the trail of happiness i think that's this is this is it this is the <laughs> stuff coming for us <laughs> <laughs> uh do you want to try sharing that again yeah let me throw this up again see there's so much information that just blew out the internet here so so there, there we go, go. <laughs> um so so when, when i first tried this run my, my first question to ollie who's our, our head blender was um what, what cocktail were you trying to make with this what what were you doing this was this for a mai tai was this for a daiquiri was this for an old-fashioned like what what rum were you trying to create? Because when you taste it, it for me, it didn't sit in a normal sort of grouping on the shelf. Normally when you get a rum, you're like, ah, oh, this is this is an agricole, this is a daiquiri rum, this is a sweet something, this is a boozy car strength. But like there's, there's these nice little categories where you can slot everything into. And I tried this, I was like, what were you trying to do? And he's like, I was just trying to make a, a rum that I would drink. I was like, <laughs> I'm not drinking. I was like, what kind of rums do you drink? He's like, whiskey. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so it's it's much drier. It's much much, uh, al almost slightly a, a, abrasive to, to some rum drinkers who are used to something smoother mm. or sweeter or, or, or lighter or something like this. And and for me, it, it, it sits in, in, in an interesting place because if you you know, we often talk in the rum world of having these gateway gateway rums or sweeter rums where people then sort of slowly move into drier, bigger, cast strength style rums. Um, and this for me is sort of almost the, the bridge point in between. You know, it's 46.2% mm. ABV or 92.4 proof in, uh, in the US. There we go. Don't hurt yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's slight, slightly boozier than a normal one, but not as far as uh, as a car strength. It's it's strong enough to not be chill filtered, to not have any extra additives or anything added to it. Um, but for me, the the really exciting part, and this is this is where for me black top became very exciting, and it's certainly in terms of what we're creating now with things like Finest Caribbean, was. The, the thing that's always pissed me off about rum blends is where people go, oh, it's a secret recipe. Oh, we can't, we can't tell you where, where it's from. We can't tell you what's in it. We can't tell you what we did. Like it's, it's a, it's a trade secret. Yeah. I just always, I've just always felt that's, that's bullshit, you know? And, and I, I know when we talked before on single cast nation, you know, the, the analogy of a chef doing, a cooking show and saying mm. here's this full dish here's here's what i want to create for you but i'm not going to tell you the recipe because maybe you'll just go and copy me and you'll you'll become a top chef too it's like well, well no that's that's bullshit you know it's like there's a long way to go before you become an at-home chef to becoming gordon ramsay or something like that just <laughs> telling me the recipe just you telling me what's in it isn't going to instantly turn me into a, a master blender overnight but what it will do is it will give me an appreciation of what those individual rums do and how much impact they have on the blend and, and what they're contributing to the blend. So, mm. so for me, being able to very openly talk about, you know, this is the exact amount of each rum that we put in. This is what it contributes. This is why we add that amount in. That's that's really key. And 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 the really exciting thing is when we do 
master classes when when we're able to travel again and I can come over to the States or even before if we can get you some samples over there. Not only will you get to try, you know, the final blend, but we'll give you each of the individual components as well. So you can try five-year-old Guyana, you can try that five-year Barbados, you can try each of the each of the raw ingredients, see what they each taste like and see then how they come together in the blend as well. So for me, this is, you know, if, if there was ever a criticism of, of something like Navy rum or the way that rum is blended today, it could be that, well, over the years, because all these different countries were blended together, you, you sometimes lose some of the providence of each of those countries. You lose some of the individual nuances and what they each contribute and what, you know, you lose the celebration of it, that country's style. For me, a blend should be a celebration of all of them. We can show you what each one does, and I can give you each one. I can talk about each distillery and say, well, look, you know, the Guyanese rum is coming from Diamond because well, that's the only distillery there. Uh, the Barbados one is coming from Foursquare Distillery, you know, the, the wonderful distillery run by Richard Seal there. The three year is coming from Long Ponds, so beautiful, high ester, funky Jamaican flavors coming through. Mm -hmm. And, and by giving you each of them, you can you can see exactly what's in it. You know, we can we can tell you exactly how many volatiles and sugar and exactly what we do to it because we, we we shouldn't be hiding behind these recipes. We should be able to say this is why we chose them and this is what they do when you put them together. That's brilliant. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the the interest you you brought you brought up his name. Uh, Richard Seal of, of Foursquare. Uh, we had him on the podcast, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe a month, month and a half ago or so. And and we, we started talking production, right? And, and one of the things that I found interesting, and I think a lot of the people who are watching may, may agree, coming from a whiskey perspective, specifically single malt whiskey, even more specifically, single malt Scotch whiskey, right? You you, th you think of a spirit that is, you're basically making a beer and you're distilling it twice in a couple of copper pot stills. You stick them in a cask, three years and a day later, it's Scotch whiskey. And when we were talking with Richard Seal about his distillation style, he said, or no, we had a question where where someone had said, well, what do you do with your retorts? And I, when I read that question, I honestly thought that that was some sort of a typo. Like I'd never <laughs> heard of a retort in my life. And this gave Richard, Richard the opportunity to, you know, in the very Richard way he does, you know, he, he loves to say, well, we, we have the, the superior distillation, distillation method uh, for producing our rum. So, so for, those, for those that are watching that may be more familiar with with single malt scotch whiskey production, could you go into how distillation within rum could could differ? Because I know there are many different still types. Yes. Um, so you know, if you could touch on some, I know I know that could take us down a massive rabbit hole. Uh, but if you could touch on on at least maybe some of the ones that produce the rums that go into your black top blend, that I think that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, so a double retort box still, I'm just seeing if I've got a picture here I can throw up for you guys to, to see. Um, let's see, I'll throw this, this one down as well. So, so in, in essence, yeah, so you, you've got, um, I, I think typically we, we always think of distillation as being either pot still or column still, okay? And, you know, if it's pot still, we, we have our nice, pot, we put our wash in there, we distill it. Um, let's say if our wash is between 6 and 8% ABV after fermentation, we might get 35% ABV at the end of the distillation. And typically, we'll run that through again, you know, so we'll, we'll double distill it to concentrate it even more, get even more of those aromatics. But also, by the, by the time we do the double distillation, we might be anywhere between could be between say 60 65 to 80 85 percent abv so okay. 
that that double distillation again everyone's familiar with that in in whiskey terms um yep. in the rum terms we have this uh double double retort pot still as well which uh, again i'm just gonna try and pull that up for you here um Um, so, uh, so a double retort pot still so we'll looks something like this. Um, so here you have you have your pot still, which is sort of familiar, but then you have these these two retorts coming off as well, and then that that little column in the, the far end is the condenser. So essentially, what you can do with the double retort pot still is create a double distillation with just one run through of the water. So to give you an idea here, what we would do is you would add your, your fresh molasses pot, if you like, into the main pot, so that's the larger one on the far right hand side. Mm -hmm. And that will still be around your say six, seven, eight percent ABD. And okay. that will be the bulk of what's going through. Then in your retorts, you will load the, them up with what we call low wines and high wines. Mm -hmm. So you'll you know, one of those retorts would be full of, say, around 35% ABV. The other one would be around, say, 65% ABV. And then as that first wash goes through from the big from the big part, it's going through, the other two retorts will be warmed up as well. And as the first distillation is coming through, it's going into this higher ABV wash, which has been preloaded from the previous distillation. This is then in turn going to the, the, the next retort, uh, which will be full of, uh, again, this higher ABV wash. And then by the time it comes through to the column, you've got your, it, essentially it's been through your double distillation process, comes through and comes off as the, as the rum that you're gonna take away. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a way of almost, it's almost like this incredible shortcut. It's this way of bypassing the need to to fully restart and reset the whole process each time, um, and and yeah, as as Richard said, you know, it's it's completely unique to the Caribbean. We don't really see this set up anywhere else in the spirits world that I've come across, um, and yet it's it's very very commonplace across the Caribbean. So it's 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 quite an incredible thing to to have as part of, of rum's distillation, but only only rum nerds seem to know about it. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, so it's a it's a fascinating little little part of the um, so it's, it's it's this fascinating distillation style. And in addition to that, we also have things like in in Jamaica, so where that still is from in Hampton, we see not just previous washes being loaded in or low wines, high wines, but sometimes we'll add things like dunder into the retorts as well. And dunder is essentially your uh, your spent molasses wash post distillation. So after all the yeah. alcohol evaporated off, your your stillage, if you like, your leftover wash, which normally would be just thrown out, watered down and, and taken away. Yeah it's this beautiful acidic uh, acidic liquid that we can then use to create more esterification, create more esters in, in, in rum. Um, and we can add that to our retorts to again, boost esterification. So especially for Jamaican rum, this addition of Dunder can become this incredible little secret sauce in our rum fermentation as well. Wow. And does, is, is the Dunder new for each for each distillation or is it something that sort of is always added to like it's just always there um so so it completely depends a, a lot of distilleries won't use dunder at all like for the, for the majority of rum distilleries your your dunder will just be discarded um we see dunder used in in various ways sometimes it is collected added to and and built upon after each distillation it's just topped up and kept in a tank or in, in some kind of storage storage vessel and used as its own little 
uh, almost like a mother broth, which is continuously added to and topped up. Okay. Think of like a ramen or something like your stock, your mother stock, which is just continuously topped up. So sure. in, in, in one sense, it can be used like that. In the other sense, it can be added straight into a retort or a distillation and added straight to a new new batch of, of fermenting molasses to, 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 again, to add acidity because mm. talk about esters in rum, which is probably a whole, whole other conversation, but we can get into it. The, when we create esters, we're talking about acid plus alcohol combining together and creating creating an ester, creating essentially a, a, a flavor, a smell, and a, an extra essence in the rum, which mm -hmm. you don't have that acidity there. You won't you won't get as many esters. So when you have a lot of acidity, you create a huge amount of, of esters in the rum as well. So what, what do you think about this? Dunder is added as a percentage. I'm not, I don't know if I fully understand the question. So I, I'm I'm guessing if I'm if I'm reading that right, sort of the idea of would you would you look at a batch of molasses? Say I had five thousand liters of molasses wash that had been fermenting for however long. Would I then add a percentage of that volume of dunder or, or a certain quantity or amount of dunder to to create it? Um, it, it really depends on the type of rum I'm trying to create at the end of distillation. So, like imagine we're, imagine we're cooking a dish, okay? Imagine we're cooking a, 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 a curry, say, and, and you say, I love spicy curries because I'm Josh Hatton and I want the spiciest thing imaginable. And I That's go, true. well, okay, well, no. I like spicy stuff myself, but this other guy we're with, he likes pretty mild stuff. Like, okay, so the rum, the rum or the curry that I'm going to make for you and I, it's going to have a lot more chili. It's going to have a lot more intensity, a lot more extra flavors and spices and chili mm -hmm. thrown in because I want to create something super intense. So I know inherently, okay, I'm going to add this much chili, this much spice to create this flavor at the end of, of the cooking process. For someone who likes something milder, I either won't add it at all or I'll add a very light amount and I'm going to create a different thing. So mm -hmm. these, I could be creating essentially the same dish for, for both groups of people, but the amount of spice I add will create different levels of intensity at the end. Got it. When we talk about this in the rum world, we talk about it not in terms of recipe necessarily, but in terms of marks. So in Jamaica, you'll often hear of marks of rum, and you ha you might have one mark of rum, which is 1,500, 1,600 esters, like right at the top end of what Jamaica is legally allowed to export as, a, as high ester rum. Yeah. Um, and for that recipe, for that mark, I'm going to add a lot more dunder and probably some extra stuff from what we call our muck pits. So the muck pits are like these almost fermenting troughs of jackfruit and sugarcane and wild yeast and everything that's just like bubbling away and smells like sewage and it's just like foul and 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 obscene but when you add a little bit of it of it it's so acidic and adds so many different uh, bacteria and cultures and yeast to the to the to the fermentation huh. that it, it it adds this layer of complexity and flavor that's irreplaceable you know it's unique to that distillery and that that, that landmark um Hampton Distillery is famous for this, you know, like they, they're famous for their muck pit and what they add to their rum. Um, now, I'm not necessarily going to do that if I want a lighter style rum. I'm going to add a lot less and, and a lot less. So often this this kind of information, to, uh, to be completely honest, is quite hard to get a hold of. You know, it's quite hard to say, mm. okay, this is the exact amount they add of the dunder or the muck or this or that because... Um, on one hand, I, I believe it's fairly much a, a trade secret and distillery secret. It's just just one of those things. Sure. Um, I, I believe as well, and, and the more and more I, I've heard different interviews with different people, it seems it's it's partly trade secret. It's partly a feel thing as well, you know, because it's going to vary from time to time. Just like when we cook a dish, we might have a recipe, but then you might go, oh, it needs a bit more of this or a bit more of that. Or, yeah you'll adjust as you go as well so I, th I think you know there's 
there is a certain art to to everything we do with with rum or or any sort of natural process or or, mm. or, or ingredient you know there's a certain element of just knowing your tools knowing what you're playing with and going right this is the amount and you know when when we when we create these recipes you know we get these very specific ester marks which are uh, measured after distillation we say okay this is 450 successes or this is 700 esters or a thousand esters or 1600 yeah. esters or or even more if you you know create whatever um it's it's not like you can distill it and go this is exactly the number i'm going to hit you'll you'll distill and yeah. yeah you'll distill and you'll get somewhere there and you might go okay that's maybe a bit higher than i wanted or a bit lower than i wanted so mm -hmm. you might take that rum and blend it with a higher or a lower ester rum to then you know balance it out and go right you know for, uh, as, I, as i mentioned before jamaica has a, a legal upper limit that you can only export 1600 ester rum now what happens if you distill 1700 esters or 1800 esters like you're not just going to throw that rum away but you could blend it with a lower ester rum bring it to the mark you want yeah. and balance it out so it's nothing is going away nothing is discarded but it's it's a raw ingredient you're playing with and and, and there's a certain element of, of balancing with it, playing with it, blending it until you get it to where you need it to be as well. Would it be would it be a fair comparison to say, you know, those that, that chase the sort of higher ester rums somewhat similar to those that chase higher you know the more highly peated whiskies right does, does it do is there a comparison there or am i just totally making a very tenuous link yeah no i think um uh i i always remember a, a friend of mine in in sydney in australia who runs a, an amazing spirit store called the oak barrel there uh and his name is scott and i was i was with him a few years ago when you know, we started seeing some of these, uh, like the Velia bottlings of the Tekka and the mm. uh, TCC and these these very high ester long ponds runs coming out. And, you know, you, t you taste them and they're, they're like drinking rocket fuel. You know, they're absolutely insane. And, and there are 100% rum lovers out there who go, oh, that's exactly what rum should taste like. You know, it should... You know, if I'm not crying when I drink it, it's not proper rum, you know? And, and I always remember Scott was like, this is exactly like it was 10 years ago when, you know, these distilleries started bringing out the highest peat PPM, the Optimores, all of this kind of stuff in the whiskey world. And whiskey lovers would, would start coming in going, but how many PPM is it? It's like, well, it's kind of irrelevant, like it's just... You know, you've got to taste the flavor and, and all these stuff, but, the, but, but how many ppm? Like, as soon as you measure it, as soon as you can quantify mm -hmm. it, the, the uber geeks go, Well, I want the highest ester or the highest ppm thing. And it's, and it's almost like, it's almost like saying to someone, What kind of music do you like? And you yeah. go, Well, I really like loud music. But what, what kind of loud music? What, what kind of, do you like country, rock, hip hop, punk? Like, what's what what flavor? What what style do you like? It's like, mm -hmm, I just like, mm -hmm. uh, I just want it intense. Like, okay, <laughs> so so it's, it's it's one measuring stick in yeah. in whole spectrum of flavor and and qualities that a realm or a spirit can have. Um, <laughs> Drew Drew says Coroni liquid asphalt like. Like yeah, like Coroni tastes like diesel to most people. Yeah, it's you know? just rubber tires, burning rubber tires to me. Yeah, and and you talk to to a lot of rum lovers, and they're like, brilliant. That's exactly yeah. yeah. I love burning rubber. You know, it's like if you're the kind of person who goes to a petrol station, you fill up your car at the gas station, and you're like. <sighs> <laughs> If you're that person, you'll love Coroni. You know, you'll love yeah, you'll love yeah, some yeah. of the highest of the maker rums. It's just 
it's just intense. It's just fun. And some people love that, that love that flavor, yeah. love that element. So. so we've got about 20 minutes or so left. Speaking of flavor, before we move on to the final thing that I want to, want to discuss, and of course, there's some questions that I'm sure we'll want to answer. Could we go over the flavors on the finest Caribbean? And just for those who haven't had it, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the flavors and, and where you think that's coming from. So, um, oh, I've just seen all the comments. I was, I was on the other chat. So now I've just seen like loads of people watching. I was like, I thought it was just you and me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> um, so, so, so flavor components for the Black Top Finest Caribbean, as I say, this, there's three main sources that you've got coming on. We've got four four rums in the blend, uh, but three three countries coming from. So Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica. Barbados uh, for me quintessentially is that balanced, elegant, fruity, tropical. Uh, it's the it's the pina colada of rums, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's 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 wonderful you know for for me if ever i'm starting someone on their rum journey i'll always start them with barbados because it's not too intense it's not too light it's not too grassy it's not too rich or sweet it's just beautifully it's that sweet spot in the middle it's and the goldilocks rum. yeah yeah, yeah. It is. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's just right and yeah. when you start with barbados from there I, I can take you on a journey anywhere around the caribbean or anywhere around the rum world you know like based on your reaction to that that's mm. it's, it's a good base it's it gives you so much fruit and vanilla and coconut and all these you know for me when people imagine drinking rum on a tropical island in their hammock drinking their cocktail rihanna's walking past you're on barbados you know that's that's that is where rum begins and it is it's where rum was first distilled it's the birthplace of rum. so so barbados gives gives for me that fruits and say those 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 tropical fruity notes but mm. not the overripe notes not that funky almost slightly rotten petrol note that you'll get from the jamaica rum now that jamaica gives you that sure. intensity. you know when you smell when you smell from this caribbean you get some of those little esters jumping out of the, out of the glass yeah and some of that yeah there's there's the jamaica bit right there yeah some of that funk like on the nose for me is where the Jamaican the Jamaican lifts up and 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 depending on depending on what you love in the rum world, this can be a very polarizing point. You know, some people smell that and they go, I don't want to dig into it. And then they taste it and they're like, Oh, actually it's much more rounded, it's much more balanced because yeah. of the other countries coming in. But Jamaica is so prominent on the nose, it can almost overwhelm the other two. And um, other people who love Jamaican rum and love that funk and intensity, they smell it and they're like, oh, yes, this is going to be a funk monster. Amazing. I'm going to really it's gonna blow my, my mouth out. And then they try it and it's smoother. It's a bit more rounded. It's a bit lighter. And they're like, well, that, that wasn't funky enough. I want it. I want just 100% Jamaica. Like, I want that intensity. So this is this is for me again where it comes so important to be able to try these individual components and and try these individual flavors because it's it's almost being able to like listen to a band and hear the individual instruments and go okay that's what the guitar's doing that's what the drums mm. that's what the bass is doing and you you might not appreciate them on their own until you hear them individually and then you try them all together and you're like ah oh, okay it kind of makes sense you know it come Perfect. come together hopefully in a way that you enjoy so yeah. Um, the the Guyana, which was um, <laughs> the Guyana. Hey, Jason, I can see you. <laughs> I wish I was that cool. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, sorry, the Guyana is that chocolate coffee licorice. It, it ranges everywhere from the the bitterness to the sweet richness of, of the wine. Mm. Um, and and we actually use two Guyanese rums in there. We use an unaged one, which is that sort of bitter, more licorice note. It's, for me, the unaged Guyana is almost like adding bitters to an old fashioned. You know, it's it's oh, nice. it's intense. It's complex. It's like it's it's tough on its own, but with the other flavors, it just adds this extra layer, which you can't get from the other rums. Yeah. yeah. 
Whereas the older Guyanese rum, the three to five year old, adds all of the chocolatiness, all of that deliciousness, and and that component I could just drink on its own all day. You know, it's just that's, you. Oh, that's, that's your happy place. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah this is um, this is such a, a go to for me, and and this this was my sort of number one go to. For rum, I don't have a lot of rums. I, I have these. I have some rums that Single Cast Nation have done. I've got some Foursquare, but yeah. this one, I think, takes on so many different flavors. Right? I really, I just, I enjoy the complexity. And this one was my go-to for complexity until I got a taste of this one. Uh huh. That's and okay. I don't think I've even seen that photo yet. <laughs> I, took, I took it earlier today. You know um nicely done yes this, this uh no i found it on uh, on mr google on, on the google machines um this black top 50th anniversary oh you've got a real bottle all i have is this little guy i'll trade you <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make sure we're sending plenty over to you this is uh yeah this is my my new baby i had to um as you again talking about trailer we went there earlier tonight for this last night and i was going to take this down and i was like if i take it down i won't come back with any we won't mm -hmm. have any taste like this will be gone so so i left it here and of course the first question when i got there was like have you got any of the 50th <laughs> so, because have to, it's we'll have to take some during lockdown <laughs> it is Remarkable. Now I've got, where is it? I, I need to pour some of this. Uh, yeah. It is absolutely remarkable. And I have a picture of the back label. Do you mind if I share that picture? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Let me see if I can bigify this. Oh, so we've actually got an updated back label and I'll tell you why. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, let's hear this. Is, there's a story okay. here. So if you want, but before you, before you get rid of that screen, just note the percentage of the Hampton in there and the, and the age of the Guyana 45 year. And I'll, um, I'll tell you the story of why this has changed. So this, the joys of blending and putting something together. <laughs> should, should, should I, should I take this one down? Do you have another one that you want yeah, to take? Take that one down, I'll throw up, uh, I'll throw up the, no the new version. So this is uh, what what I what I believe is one of the sexiest back labels in, in the rum world, I'll say. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. <laughs> hey, <bye. laughs> yeah, look at um, that. The numbers are different, aren't they? So so I, I am very, very excited and very, very proud of this rum label. This was a, a conversation that lasted many, many weeks between uh, Ollie Chilton, our head blender, Sakinda, uh, and myself. And we went back and forth on this because one of the things I loved that with, with Finest Caribbean was that we talked about the blend percentage of what's in there. But what I really wanted to do was be able to uh, <laughs> be able to put this on the label and be able to, to make this as transparent as possible. You know, there's such a push for transparency in the rum industry. Um, there's such a, uh, you know, you only have to spend about three minutes on a rum forum and, and someone's like saying, come on, we need more transparency. We need, we need more of this. And, but for rum blends, it's, it's never really been, been there um, to, to this degree for, for me, you know, and being able to talk about what each component does in a rum blend, it's always, you know, Oh, I'm the master blender. I put this together. It's like, mm -hmm. no, let's talk about the recipe again. So, so for me, there there are some very important parts on this that I wanted to include. Um, first of all, obviously, country of origin, where it's being distilled, where the DNA of the rum is coming from. Secondly, the distillery where it was made. Um, uh, thirdly, whether that distillery is still running or not, because there are some places here which which don't exist anymore. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the type of still, obviously, is very important as well. And um, one of the most important things for me when we're talking about the age of a rum, uh, presuming we're we're giving it a real number and not just some made-up number, um, hmm. 
knowing the number of years it's spent not just in a barrel but where that barrel was you know if we if we age a run in scotland for five years it's very different to we if we age that same barrel of rum in barbados for five years sure um you know for one barbados is a lot hotter you know it's like in at, at its coldest it might be 20 21 degrees you know um scotland gets a lot colder um, has about two weeks of sunshine it's lovely uh but then it's gone again you know so so that the 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 heat is the obvious example that we talk about when we we versus tropical versus continental aging but also the climate the the humidity uh what that barrel's experiencing um how much evaporation you're losing in terms of water versus losing alcohol from the barrel um how much contraction and expansion you're having between if it's hot and cold or if it's just constantly sort of a similar temperature all of these things are going to change and there is a, a huge precedent in the rum world for many distilleries aging their rum or selling their rum uh, in bulk to blenders to brokers a uh, place like Shear in Amsterdam Main Rum in Liverpool uh, different places around the world and getting a rum that's tropically aged is more expensive it's harder it's it's rarer as well um, sure. and and yeah having the breakdown having having the understanding of what a rum's actually experienced is very very important so what we've done on the back label here is had a full breakdown of tropical versus continental aging now the only two rums where we can't do that are on our 42 year I flipped coming from the Port Morant still um, purely because the records don't exist of at what point it left Guyana and what point it came to Europe and, and we don't have an accurate record of it. If we ever find it out, I will share it with you. Um, the Navy rum blend itself, you know, we know typically Navy rum was, was distilled, shipped out pretty young. Uh, it would have been shipped in cask at sea, so it would have had some sort of, you know, it wouldn't have been stored in plastic containers and shipped out as it would nowadays. It would have been transported in the barrel, and then it would have been blended and sort of vatted in these open wood Solera vats. So, you know, these vats being very big, you could argue how much wood integration it was actually having. However, there'd be a huge amount of evaporation because they're all open top. So there's there's lots of different things that but again it's very hard to give a sort of accurate breakdown on, on tropical versus continental for those two um and then you have the blend percentage on the right hand side and this is again this is the part which i i love on our labels we've we've told you exactly the recipe and told you exactly what's going on in here so um so yeah and it's delicious i i yes. hope <laughs> <laughs> you, and you agree on that but yeah so so i'm going to make two comments here the first comment is you know john glazer of of compass box only wishes he could get this level of transparency on the label unfortunately you know the scotch um the swa scotch whiskey association doesn't allow for that but the mm. fact that you were able to get this push through especially through the TTB here in the US, uh, it, like I, I imagine you probably, there were five people who looked at this label, the first four just passed out, not knowing what to do. And then the fifth one says, I don't wanna end up like them and then just approved it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it really is remarkable, the the level of transparency, but, uh, and, and, and I'm gonna make a, a bold statement here. So every year I, I come up with a list of my my top three whiskeys um, that I purchased and then my my favorite whiskey that I bottled. And this is without a doubt going to knock knock out one of my top three whiskeys as just wow. one of my top three spirits of all year. I think it's absolutely remarkable the the level of complexity. Um, the, the ride that this takes from nose to palate to finish is just, uh, it's perfect. It's, it really is beautiful. So I, my, my hat's off to, to you and to, to Ollie and you, see, yeah. you, 
you really quickly you had said oh wait a second i have this second label let you know let's let's look at this other one and there's a reason why yeah it's a great story <laughs> okay it's a very 2020 uh uh covid19 kind of story so um so yeah so i i, I said before that the original label had a 45 euro eiflet and six percent hampton and i think if we throw up the the label again on this we're up to eight percent hampton and 42 year i flip yeah so yeah and these two stories fantastic booze stories that just happened behind the scenes so we're probably not meant to tell anyone but it's good to know um so first of all the 45 year i flip where we lost three years to give you an idea we have this uh bottling of black tart which i i'm pretty sure is only available in europe at the moment but it's a 40 year old Guyanese rum um, distilled in the Port Morant still whilst the Port Morant was at Eiflet, um, mm. closed distillery in Guyana. It was distilled in 1975. There were five casks of it. Um, and when we bottled Black Top 40 year old, we took the rum from these five casks, put them together. There was a a bit of rum left over, which was all consolidated into one cask and, and kept aside. Um, two years later, we did a bottling of, uh, I believe it was just 24 bottles for Luca Gargano at Bellio in Italy. Um, and he released a black top, uh, 19, it just says black top. Uh, so it's the same bottle as the 40 year old we did, but it's labeled slightly differently. And that is the 40 year old rum at 42 years. And he did 24 bottles of it. It's almost impossible to find. We don't even have pictures of it. It's really weird. Like it's <laughs> like, it was a small little thing that we did for Luca and, and he has the last two bottles known in existence. I don't know where the other 22 went. And um, when we came to bottle this, when Ollie was doing the blend, one of the things he noticed was it needed and you know we had all these amazing rums being blended together but it needed some something really tannic and and heavy and complex to add to it and if you've ever had the black top 40 year old it's it's super woody it's real oaky rich intensity of flavor yeah. um, and I, again like i talked about earlier about the idea of adding a little bitters to your old-fashioned yeah. this this rum, as, as incredible as it is on its own, when you add it to a blend, it just adds all of this weight and this, this character that all of those tannins and, and all that wood has in it. Um, and so we were like, well, we'll add a little bit of this to the rum and it just made it beautiful. Um, when we contacted the, the bottling hall that had these casks, um, we said, oh, we'd like to take it out the cask and put it in. They're like, oh, it's not in the cask, it's in the container. And we said, what do you mean? And they said, well, three years ago, you did this bottling for Luca Gargano and Velia, and we took it out the cask to bottle it, those 24 bottles, and the rest we just put into a container because we didn't think we'd put it back in the cask. And it's just like, you didn't put it back in the cask? And they're like, no. Oh, so, no instantly lost three years so again you know transparency is not always what you want it to be <laughs> but you know it lost those three years um, the hampton is an even better story though so the hampton because normally during any other kind of bottling like this i know someone asked how many bottles uh, jason asked how many bottles of this we're doing we're doing five thousand bottles of this so it's a, a one-off edition it's come to the u.s real soon i think it'll be with you guys in the next month or so i'm hoping uh, next next few weeks yeah in yep. a few weeks um so there's five thousand bottles worldwide and uh, it's very limited amount and anything limited that we do at elixir distillers ollie jilton and our head blender will normally go and oversee personally and he'll make sure that exactly the right amount of every spirit every barrel is added to it because you know not not saying he has control issues, but he just likes to be sure that it's done right and it's you know it's very expensive, irreplaceable liquid. Then we had a, then we had a global pandemic, 
And um, so we had these casks and we couldn't travel and we couldn't go up to the bottling hall. So Ollie just sent a very detailed set of instructions of how much of each cask to add to get those percentages down. This is his blend that he's put together. He wants that scaled up to 5,000 bottles. And when they sent back the sample, uh, <laughs> Ollie and Sakinda were trying it for the first time when they first got it back. It was like, this is really funky, like super, super Jamaican. And Sakinda kind of looked at Ollie and was like, what are you doing? And he's like, I didn't do this. I'm sure I didn't do this. Like, goes back to the bottling hall, just checking, just checking that you just added the third of the cask of Hampton to the blend. And they're like, no, we added the whole cask. Now, of all of the components, if you're, if you're a rum lover watching this, of all of the components out of everything we had there, if there was any rum out of those rums which you could add too much of and really throw out the whole blend, it would be this super funky, intense Hampton Jamaican rum, right? Oh, Jesus. And they've added a whole cask of it. So then this panic happens of like, <laughs> is, there, is there enough of the other rums to balance this out again? Uh, yeah, right? Yeah. It's too, too much Jamaica. And the, the philosophy that Ali and Sakinda have with any of their blends is if it's not good, they just won't do it. They would rather not bottle something shit and, and not have anything at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if it's not great, we won't do it. So, so Ollie starts like seeing how much more, because we had flagons of the original Navy rum in there. We had this 42 year old Guyanese rum in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these like 23 year old Crony, all these other casts, is like, how much of the other rum have we got? So, we got as many of these extra casks as, as we could, pulled as much rum as we could together, and essentially balanced it as close as he could to the original recipe, but with a little bit more Jamaican now, of course. Um, and it tastes, tastes like it does now, like it's beautiful. Um, but the best part was, since, since I first started with working with Ollie, I said, wouldn't it be cool if we did something like the original black top navy rum blend was like rather than just making a batch of rum and, and that's it what if we had like a continuously perpetual blend going on that we continuously topped up with different casts and different flavors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. layer upon layer and layer it was like that's years away we'll never do that it's too like it'll be too expensive it's too silly we won't do it so i get this phone call saying we've now we've now got because of these extra casts, we've now got a third extra rum that we didn't we didn't want before. It's perfect. We're, we're going to make five thousand bottles of the the fiftieth anniversary, but what we'll do with this extra third is this will become the base for next year's black top blend. So we'll add that third, add new casks on top of it. We'll make a third extra next year. That will become the base for the year after. So basically, every year. All of these flavors, all of these casts will keep topping up, topping up, topping up, topping up, and you'll have the full breakdown in each label so you can basically piece together how the rum blend evolves over the years. So, wow. Yeah. It, it, you know, you saying that makes me think of those, those tanks you had talked about where you had the interconnecting pipes that were a third up from the bottom, right? Exactly. It's, it's, it's perfect. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's wow. so good. and and i love that you know when we when we try something like last consignment you know we're we are essentially guessing we're looking at old records trying to piece together what was in that realm and we we have a rough idea but it's 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 an estimate you know with this with this black top blend that we're creating every year you'll have the full breakdown the full recipe and i'm sure there's going to be some rum nerds out there who'll piece mm. together year by year by year what the evolving blend becomes is like each percentage becomes smaller and tinier and it just becomes this ridiculous uh list of some of the most amazing distilleries around the world so yeah it's um as amazing as this 50th anniversary is i'm even more excited for next year's because that will be the next step on this so. 
I, 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 I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm, I'm excited for this to hit store shelves. I know that um, as a Hanukkah gift to myself, I may have to get myself a couple of bottles of this. Well, a Hanukkah is eight nights, so maybe eight bottles. We'll, we'll see. See if I can afford that. Um, <laughs> we, we went a little bit over. So I just, you know, for, for yeah, and I, you know what, I, I knew we would. Because, I mean, the fact of the matter is I've, I have, I've done my very best to try to edit this. Like you, I know you, you could speak about rum for hours. <laughs> like if we didn't put a leash on you, it would just be like <laughs> off to the races. Um, so, so for anybody who's, who's watching, if it, you know, I know we answered some questions along the way, but, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, so Bill Myers uh, wants to know what the MSRP is um, on the rums. I think the, the 50th is going to be around 150 on the shelf, somewhere around there, plus or minus. The finest, Carib finest Caribbean, depending on the state, um, you know, I, I've I've seen it around, let's say 50 plus or minus. I've seen it up as high as 60, 65. I've seen it lower in other places as well. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, geez. You ready for this question? <laughs> I got, so so when, when Drew, Drew and I first met, Drew was, one, Drew was the first uh, U.S. interview uh, that I did. And... Um, oh. And when we first started and, and like he messaged me, I think on Facebook or Instagram, and I was like, yeah, cool, let's do this. Garrison, happy hour, amazing. And we start off and like he reels off for the first five minutes, like my whole life story, every job I've ever done, everyone I've ever like written for, or like done any work with. And I was like, and I'm just looking at the screen going, how did you find out all this stuff? You know, and he's like, oh yeah, you know, done some research. And I was probably, uh -huh. Yeah, at the start. <laughs> like, he's, a, he's a real creeper, huh? That true. Uh, <laughs> but, but it was incredible, like his attention to detail and focus. And, and I've, got to, I've got to say as well, Drew, in that first lockdown, when everyone, everyone in the world, brands, everyone was working out, what the hell do we do with this? Uh, Drew was pretty much the first person I saw who went, I'm just going to start this happy hour virtual yeah. get one yeah. together bring the community together the booze world and do this thing and and to be honest like he he inspired a lot of what we did with black top 24 hours with what i think a lot of brands wow. did he he just brought the the spirits world together in, in a way that no one really knew how to do or what they were doing at the time so you know hats off to drew he was a, a real trendsetter with that so um yeah it's uh cheers. <laughs> and also, also just seems to kill it at being a dad as well, like dressing up as superheroes, doing awesome stuff. It's like, yeah, he, he, he seems like a real good dad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that that's amazing. Yeah, I, I was also on the, on his happy hour, and it was just a, a an amazing time. And in seeing his schedule, it was a relentless. Oh, schedule. Ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, Mitch, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, it, it's really it's always a treat talking with you, and I I feel I always learn something a bit new. I get a little bit smarter each time, which is kind of dangerous. <laughs> um, but kind of like Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson once said. Uh, every time I learn something new, I push some old stuff out of my brain. <laughs> I don't know what it is that I've lost, but I've gained some rum knowledge. So that's that's good. And I think as long as it's whiskey, it's fine. Just you know, <laughs> <laughs> getting on to the important stuff now. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, on that note, uh, I will wish you good night, and uh, and we'll 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 see you soon for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. And thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone in the, in the US and Canada who's supporting us over there. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, 
there, there couldn't be a tougher year to launch a brand or do any of the things that we're doing in the booze industry. So whether you're supporting us or supporting your bars or bartenders, whoever it is, um, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and uh, keep it going. We're, we're, we're not out of the woods yet, but we're going to be there soon. So. Speaking of which, enjoy your lockdown. Yeah. You're firmly back into the woods for, for a good yeah. while. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and good luck with the election as well. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Ooh, yeah, spicy. It's <laughs> We're praying for you guys. You pray for us. We'll get through this together. <laughs> All right. Take care, Mitch. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks to everyone for, for sticking around throughout the, the whole conversation. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the talk with Mitch as, a, as much as I enjoyed talking with Mitch. I learned so much. Um, and I think, you know, it, event after event, conversation after conversation, um, I know I'm learning a lot and I, and I hope you are too. I hope you've been enjoying them. Just to give you all uh, uh, the run of events coming up between our next one, which is coming up this Sunday, and in our last one, which will be on Wednesday, December 16th, I just want to read them off to you. So this Sunday, uh, October 13th, now this will be a different time. This will be 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. We'll have Tal and Tomer from the Milk and Honey Distillery out of Tel Aviv. That will be a really fun time. Both Tal and Tomer are fun, funny, knowledgeable, uh, they'll be just a great time. Um, after that, on Wednesday, November 11th, uh, and this is back to, you know, same bat time, same bat channel, so 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Pacific, we'll have Chris Udy uh, of Impex Beverages, and he'll be going over Oishi and Fukano distilleries, and that's a rice-based distillate. So, so if you're interested in rice based Japanese whiskeys, you'll definitely want to attend that. And I apologize, I said October 13th, I meant November 11th. Um, on November 18th, that's also a Wednesday, we will have, and his name came up a couple of times in this conversation, we'll have Ali Chilton of Port Askeg. He's the, uh, the master blender of Port Askeg. And we'll go over uh, all the different malts that he's put together there. And because I love Ollie so much, I'm gonna bring him back for a second week in a row. So he'll be coming back on Wednesday, December 2nd, uh, where he'll be talking about single malts of Scotland. So that's uh, independently bottled whiskey, predominantly single cast whiskey. And he gets to talk about his selections and some of his favorite distilleries and so forth. And then fast forward to Wednesday, December 9th, we'll have Chris Udy back and he'll be talking about Matsui brands. So Matsui is a, a single malt distillery in Japan that creates Japanese single malt whiskey under the Matsui brand, but they also have Kuriyoshi, which is Japanese pure malt, and then Totori, which are Japanese blends. And then finally on December 16th, and that's the final Wednesday, we will have Jason Johnston Yellen uh, from Single Cast Nation with with us, and uh, he is, as many of you likely know, is my is my business partner and my dear friend, and I get to interview him, so that should be that should be good fun too. And we'll be discussing Single Cast Nation. So, thank you all so much for joining. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you this Sunday uh, with Tal and Tomer from Milk and Honey. And until then, be well, stay Corona free and uh, enjoy some good drink. Cheers. <laughs>